Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to CSC 2058 Software Engineering and Systems Development. I'm delighted this morning to have Garth Gilmore from Instill, and Instill is a company that does a lot of training with leading organizations uh, around the world, and you may well end up in your later work being on a training exercise organized by Instill. Garth is going to give us a really wide sweeping uh, talk this morning, 10 big ideas covering all kinds of factors from the importance of using versioning through personal feedback, naming conventions, different programming styles. And I hope this will really give you some nice ideas for the way you can follow some of the latest trends in software engineering and make them part of your own work at university and beyond. So I'll hand you over at this point to Garth. Thank you very much indeed. Um, hi everybody. So uh, first and foremost, just to say um, I'm uh, I'm slowly getting better from COVID at the moment. So uh, apologies if I cough and splutter a little bit and uh, drink frequently just to uh, keep the throat lu lubricated. Yeah. Right. So let's um, let's make a start in. Uh, so I believe you have these slides available to you. So I'm going to fly through them quite rapidly. And then at the end, there'll be the uh, the, the opportunity for questions. So uh, as was said, my name is Garth Gilmore. I was a full time software developer for about six or seven years, uh, doing mostly C++ and Java. And then the opportunity came up to give this kind of thing a go. And I thought, what the hell? Try it out. Probably only last six months. And that was about 20 years ago. Uh, so back of an envelope, I've done about a, a, a thousand engagements engagements or more, you know, different kinds of training courses or workshops or contract development or coaching or technical writing, you know, but based around those particular areas. So uh, I work for a company called Instill in Belfast. Uh, Instill is predominantly a software development company. Uh, I think we're up to about 60 people now. I'm about 80, 90 percent of what we do is software development, but we've always done professional services as well. So uh, I run the professional development side of the business and uh, we do all those activities I mentioned a minute ago. And uh, the, these are a few of the clients that we, uh, we, we work for. So uh, for the past uh, Two years or so, the services that we deliver, we've been delivering remotely. Um, has turned out to be a silver lining, definitely miss being in the classroom, but the advantage of delivering everything remotely is that suddenly you're on an equal footing with people, you know, all over the world. So uh, what we've always done the plane, trains and automobiles thing, you know, to, to travel, to be with the client wherever they happen to be. Uh, but now that we're delivering virtually, well, you know, the, the competitive advantage of a training company right beside the client, well, that's gone, you know. So we're, uh, um, we're finding that to be very, very useful. So it's, uh, uh, every cloud has the silver lining as you might say so uh, i'm doing an awful lot of my work these days with the uh, with the cat sitting in my lap and uh, one little plug we will be at the recruitment fair which i think is on the ninth so if you want to talk to us there uh, come along and you'll be made very welcome so the the purpose of this talk is just the top 10 ideas that I would like to put into your heads. Yeah. So I said to myself, OK, uh, let's assume that I had just done a computer science software engineering degree and uh, was heading out into the industry and wanted to make a career of it and all that kind of thing. Well, uh, what were the main ideas that I would want to know? You know, what are the things that don't get stressed enough in academia that do really matter in the uh, the real world? And these are the ideas. So unsurprisingly, none of these ideas are new. They're all very old and uh, they're all continuously being emphasized online on places like Twitter and so on. So I've thrown in uh, a whole pile of uh, tweets into the, the deck from senior figures in, uh, in our industry. So as you all know, you know, uh, copying from one source is plagiarism and a bad idea. Uh, copying from two or more sources is research and a good idea, you know. So that's, uh, that's what I've done to put this talk together. Uh, so let's just run through them. And then, as I say, at the end, there'll be a, a, an opportunity for as many questions as you like. So thing number one, obviously, in my job, uh, I talk uh, a lot to junior developers and developers who've been in the industry for a few years now. And I always say, look, looking back, 
what's the one thing you wish you knew more about going in? And uh, the answer is almost always version control. And uh, this is understandable, of course, whenever you're doing your degree by necessity, you're working on assignments by yourself and in small groups and so on. And uh, I like to say that most of the problems of software engineering go away whenever you're in brick throwing range. You know, whenever you're in the same room or maybe the same virtual room uh, with uh, a bunch of colleagues that you know well and the lines of communication are open and so on. Um, on the other hand, whenever you're working on a large application, potentially millions of lines of code that's been developed over years or decades uh, by different teams working in different companies most of them don't know one another and so on. Well, that's a really, really different, difficult scenario. And uh, that's where version control becomes more and more important because, of course, you're going to be making your contributions. Other people are going to be making their contributions at the same time and you have to get everything to line up. So I, I remember back in the day, the first training course I was sent on, uh, everybody had a machine and we were given a frog. And only the person who had the frog uh, on the top of their monitor was allowed to check into version control, you know, and then uh, so you know, that, that was a nice, simple way of coordinating everything. Uh, that's not a luxury that we have these days. Uh, and you can spin it in a positive sense. Version control, I think, is our big gift to the industry because uh, or to the world even, because if you go out and look at other professions, if you look at civil engineering or law or even medicine, uh, the way that they keep track of their records is very shoddy by comparison. And again, it's something that we've been forced into by necessity where we have million line code bases and we have to uh, coordinate the handling of all the resources and so on. So time spent learning about version control is incredibly important and uh, these days that means git yeah so i i would encourage you to go out and learn as much about git as you possibly can and of course everything is open source and freely available and that uh, you can create a, a toy little project and then pretend to be different users you know you can take on different personas and deliberately cause errors and try and get yourself out of trouble and so on so uh, le learn as much about Git as you possibly can. And uh, it's worth saying that, you know, this whole area is, of course, very complicated. You know, distributed version control is going to be very complicated to begin with. And also Git is a little bit unfortunate in that the people who did the actual implementation, well, they were the people who uh, thought up the names for all the commands, you know, that you would use uh, on the terminal and so on to, uh, to check things in the night. And that's a big problem uh, because, as we'll talk about later, Later, the one person you don't want coming up with the names for things is the person who knows the most about the implementation because they're too close to the wood to see the trees. You know that their their mind has been poisoned by all the little details of the implementation. So the the names that they come up with will be very precise uh, and be very accurate. But simultaneously, they'll be incredibly unhelpful to people who are trying to uh, to learn the technology. So that's a that's a weakness in Git, which in fairness, they are trying to fix uh, by introducing new and more friendly commands. Yeah. Uh, but definitely uh, go out and learn as much about version control and as much about Git as you possibly can. Uh, thing number two, uh, find and tighten feedback cycles. So uh, there's a fellow called Kent Beck, and uh, if they ever had like a competition, you know, to nominate the uh, the most influential person in the evolution of Agile, it would probably be Kent Beck. You know, so. Um, one of the, uh, the the really big names in our industry and uh, one of the drivers behind an awful lot of the technologies that you're going to end up using day in, day out. Yeah. So uh, Kent is great. I, I strongly encourage you to read everything he's ever written, uh, to uh, to watch all of his talks on YouTube and so on. Uh, absolutely brilliant speaker. So uh, for me, this is the best of his tweets. Um, it's not the number of hours I work in a day that measures progress. It's the number of feedback loops I can complete. OK, I cannot stress how important that is. So um, if you were to try and take all of Agile yeah, and condense Agile down to one idea, it would be the idea that we go out and we find and we tighten feedback loops because it's only whenever we are in a feedback loop that we actually learn. And the faster and more precise the feedback you get, the faster the learning process is going to be. So again, one of the 
assumptions that people tend to get from software engineering is that you can design a system by going to the whiteboard and thinking very, very, very hard, you know, and uh, d doing lots of software engineering diagrams and then coming up with the solution, you know, and then after that point, the coding is straightforward and self-evident and you can get a tool to do it or, you know, it's, it's all straightforward. That, that's not the way it works. The, the systems that we work with today are so complicated, there is no way they could have been designed up front. So what you do is you get something small and straightforward working, and then you add a bit, and then you add a bit, and then you add a bit, and we incrementally uh, grew outwards in uh, in feedback cycles. And uh, the the more feedback cycles we can find, and the test, and the tighter we can make them, the uh, the better for us. So I've thrown in uh, a few quotes from you know agile software gurus talking about uh, this kind of thing. The the one here from Michael Hill is my personal favourite. Um, my policy is this. Find the nearest, easiest, simplest team felt OE and fix it and fix it. Yeah. And then just repeat that process. Just uh, just keep going. OK, so whenever you enter industry, you'll find that there are different kinds of feedback cycles that we can use uh, in an agile project, uh, t test driven development, behavior driven development, integration tests, build pipelines, various ways of automating non-functional testing and so on. And in particular, you're going to be working in iteration or sprints or whatever you want to call them. And at the end of each iteration, you want to have a demo to the client, yeah? And you want to do a retrospective. And those are two key ways in which we get feedback on how we're doing, okay? So, yeah. Uh, so then number three, um, expect to feel fear and anxiety. You know, one of the biggest problems in industry is people being afraid of being afraid. <laughs> you know, they, they they have fear about feeling afraid. Yeah, but fear is perfectly normal, you know. So uh, uh, everybody in IT feels fear and anxiety all the time. So uh, we have a house rule in, at Instill that it's not OK not to ask. You know, always ask whenever you're in trouble. Because, uh, again, we're doing really complicated things and things are changing all the time. You know, there are new libraries, new frameworks, new technologies, new languages coming out all the time. And uh, you can't be expected to manually keep track of all of this all the time. You know, uh, it's my job to do this, you know, and pretty much nothing else. And uh, it absolutely overwhelms me on a daily basis, you know. So how much more so when you're supposed to be writing a, a derivatives trading platform, you know. Uh, so uh, fear is perfectly normal, yeah. Uh, I remember watching a documentary about trainee chefs and uh, that they were in this industrial kitchen being given a task to do and uh, their lecturer was shouting at them, you know, the, the feeling of tension and apprehension that you feel in your gut, get used to it, you know, uh, you're going to feel that every evening when you have to do service, you know. Uh, so in IT, we recognise that there's going to be anxiety, there's going to be fear and so on. And then we say, right, we know this is going to happen. Yeah. So uh, how do we you know, dampen this down? Yeah. And uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to realising that everybody has imposter syndrome. Uh, everybody forgets things. Everybody gets stuck. And uh, just being able to raise your hand and going to talk to your mentor or ask the question or whatever, you know, so um, sharing helps. Yeah. And if you're in a senior more senior position it's your job to go out and you know offer to uh, to be kind to people and uh, respond to their questions and be available when you're needed and so on so so don't be afraid of being afraid yeah uh, then the next one, uh, social skills matter. Uh, absolutely. So again, you know, if you do a, like a purist degree in computer science, uh, you might think it's all about the programming. Um, but none of the systems we build in industry these days, or at least very few of them, count as genuine academic research. If you're going to be a developer in industry, you might be doing something for the first time within this problem domain, you know, or within your company, or uh, or even within your industry. But it would be really unusual for you to do be doing Doing something for the first time on behalf of humanity, <laughs> you know. So uh, all the things that we do whenever we're building systems and in industry, somebody else has done in some shape or form before, you know, because that's where libraries come from and frameworks come from and so on. So you're going to find that the really hard parts are going to be, first of all, collaborating with your teamwork, your teammates. Uh, and then even more so collaborating with the customer and discovering what it actually is that the uh, that the customer needs you to do and so on. And uh, these days, 
it's not the case that any single person can go out and um, write the entire system from scratch. It's a team sport. You know, it has to be a team sport from now on. OK, and uh, I don't know if you remember House, uh, absolutely wonderful medical show. And uh, there was a wonderful quote from House, which was that um, the rules have to apply even to those they shouldn't apply to. <laughs> In other words, uh, you, you may be a special creative genius, you know, but at the end of the day, nobody's that special. Yeah. So uh, whenever we're developing software and industry, we're part of a team. OK, so you don't get to be the, the isolated genius, you know, working away in solitude for years and then coming up with some brilliant idea. It's not going to work. And uh, it's not even the case where like an orchestra where everybody has one skill. You know, everybody gets away with just playing one particular instrument and, you know, months in advance what piece you're going to be performing and what date and so on. It's more like a jazz band. You know, we all need to riff off one another and we don't go into the, um, the, the gig knowing necessarily what music we're going to be playing and we have to react to the vibe we get off the, uh, the audience and so on. So we have to be integrated as a team. Uh, at a much, much deeper level, you know. So social skills, team skills are uh, incredibly important. And there's a there's a few other tweets there to uh, to bear this out. Yeah. Uh, then the next one, you know, so, so far we've kind of been talking about things that you don't do enough of. Uh, here's one that you may have done too much of. OK, uh, performance. Yeah. So does performance matter? You know, do, does the performance of your code matter? Yeah. And the answer is, Absolutely yes and absolutely no. <laughs> OK, so uh, so software development, as you know, covers a huge number of different kinds of systems. You know, uh, you might be writing uh, an embedded real time thing or you might be trying to write a platform for derivatives trading. Um, but equally, you might be doing some kind of batch based thing, you know, that just uh, migrates records to some back uh, backup data store overnight or something like that. And um, as long as it does the job properly, it doesn't matter if it gets it's done in one hour or uh, seven hours, you know, so uh, you cannot always say that performance is going to be the most important thing. It could be the correctness. It could be the safety. Uh, it could be the um, satisfying the, the requirements. Uh, it could be beating the competition to market and so on. So uh, if there's one thing that software developers obsess about, it's performance. Yeah. But performance is just one piece of the jigsaw. Sometimes the most important piece, sometimes not a particularly important piece. Everything depends on the context. And uh, even in situations where performance matters, what do you mean by performance? You know, uh, so uh, uh, this is not my field, but I'm privileged to work with some performance engineers. And uh, I know that if you go up to them and say we need to improve performance, um, it's a bit like the, the old fable about Eskimos and snow. You know, they'll, they'll say, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you mean the latency, the time it takes items to be processed? Do you mean the, the overall throughput of the system? Do you mean scalability? You know, you want to have confidence there's the number of users goes up. Performance will very gracefully go down. And that kind of thing. You don't want there to be a cliff edge that performance suddenly falls over. Yeah. Or uh, is it utilization that you care about? If you're deploying to the cloud, as you have more and more people using the system, uh, you want your system to uh, create more instances of the, the microservices or the, the channels or whatever it happens to be. And then you want these to be released, you know, as uh, the demand goes back down again and so on. So even when performance does matter, it's not every conceivable definition of performance, it's some form of performance and you need to work out what that is, you know, so that the takeaway lesson is that performance isn't always the most important thing. In fact, I would say, you know, it, it's usually the, the second, third, fourth most important thing uh, that these days. Yeah. And even when performance is the most important thing, it's a particular definition of performance, not just performance. Yeah. Uh, then the next one, uh, write code with two hats. OK, so uh, Nobody manages to write good code first time round. OK, if you are working on the problem and the problem is appropriate to your level of ability, you know, it's a hard problem for you, whatever that means. OK, well, then you're going to do a pretty lousy solution first time round. Yeah, because you're going to be so focused on understanding the requirements and getting the algorithm right. And at the end of the day, just getting the damn data <laughs> you know, uh, on the screen or over the network or into the database or whatever, you know, you're going to be so 
so focused on the goal uh, that you're going to commit terrible, terrible sins. OK, so you will give things terrible names. Uh, you will write functions that are far too long. You will choose the wrong kind of loop. Uh, you will do FP where you should be doing a woe and a woe where you should be doing FP, you know, and so on and so on and so on. OK, so uh, everybody writes uh, terrible code the first time round. Yeah. And also, we all go through a stage of wanting to show off how smart we are. You know, it's referred to as golden hammer syndrome, and I think it's inevitable. Yeah. So um, it especially happens when you've learned your first language really well, you know, and you deliberately write code to show off um, all the features of the language. You know, as so if it was Java, uh, you go out and use generics where it's not required and reflection to make function calls and uh, parallel streams where no parallelism would yield you know, more benefit, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so um, the there are these twin forces that cause us problems, OK? And uh, this can lead to really terrible code uh, making it into production, OK? And this is not something that we want to do. So what we want to do is the same thing that uh, a creative writer would do, yeah? In your second draft, make it look like you knew what we were doing first time round, <laughs> yeah? So first time round, we get our ideas down, you know, if you're a writer, you know, we, we get the damn thing working, yeah? And then we come along and re refactor, you know, we tidy up, we improve our code with fresh eyes, you know? And uh, uh, as they say, we destroy our darlings, you know? Uh, we notice where we've been overly clever just because we were geeking out in golden hammer syndrome and so on. And then uh, we are remorseless yeah, in trying to make the code uh, shorter, safer, simpler, easier to understand, because it's all about making the code uh, more maintainable for the next generation of developers, which could very easily be yourself in a fortnight. Yeah. And then allied to that, uh, is the idea that every line of code is technical debt. What we mean by that is that, you know, you check the code into version control, and then that will have to be looked at by different generations of developers, and tests will have to be written for that code, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we don't want code. We want functionality. <laughs> you know, uh, code is what gets us to having functionality. So we need to write code whenever possible. Okay, but it's not the the old idea that more code is better. You know, the the worst thing we could possibly have in the office would be a thermometer. And um, let's say every couple of days the uh, management comes along and draws a line and fills in the bar and goes, "Well done, another thirty thousand lines or whatever." That's the you know the the worst situation that we could possibly be in. You know, so uh, less is more. You know, absolutely. And uh, we have to make sure that you're continuously refactoring your code, but don't do both at the same time. OK, so as the title of this section expresses, the idea is that you wear two hats. OK, so the first hat is the get the damn thing working hat. And then the second hat is the tidy up your code hat. Yeah, don't wear both at the same time. Otherwise, you'll go into the code base to implement a feature and then you'll notice a bit of untidiness and that will lead you to another bit of untidiness and another little bit of untidiness. And it ends up being like Father Ted with the hammer in the car, if you're familiar with that episode, you know, and uh, you'll have completely forgotten why you came into the code to implement the feature in the first place. And uh, maybe that means all that code then has to be thrown away and you've just wasted a day. So uh, there are two hats. Yeah. But don't wear both at the same time. It's a, it's a really bad idea. Um, so number seven, uh, and related to what we've just talked about before, naming is incredibly important. So one of the most powerful refactorings you can do is to take the names that you've given your types and your functions and your local variables and so on and uh, improve the names. Yeah, because people are staggeringly bad uh, at communication. So here's a, a site I always point to online uh, when cakes go wrong. I think there are a bunch of sites like this and it's just hilarious examples of things that have gone wrong when people were, um, were ordering cakes. And uh, the most famous one is the one in the bottom right, uh, which I think has gone wrong on a number of occasions where somebody brought in on a memory stick uh, a photo to be iced onto the cake and somebody from the back office shouted, what's going on the cake? And somebody else shouted, it's on the counter, you know. So what they did was they iced a picture of the memory stick onto the cake. 
whoops, you know. So if this is the kind of stuff that can go wrong uh, when people are ordering cakes, how much more so whenever we're trying to build systems, okay? And uh, we need to understand that our terminology is not the only terminology or even the right terminology. So one of the most important things we need to learn is that we need to go out in the world and learn about other industries. So if you end up working in insurance, you need to learn about insurance. Banking, learn about banking. Uh, derivatives trading, learn about derivatives trading. You know, um, you, you could end up needing to learn about um, uh, the aerospace industry or the, the defense industry or what, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. So whatever the domain is that you're working in, you need to go out and understand the terminology of that uh, domain. Yeah. Because each terminology has its own particular meanings for words and specialist terms and so on. OK. And uh, so some of these terms are hilarious or even, you know, insulting in uh, in other contexts and so on. Yeah. So this, of course, is well known about language in general. And there's some superb books, you know, you, you might be interested in there. Uh, my first degree was in philosophy, so I'm hugely into this kind of thing, you know. So um, language is only relevant uh, in a particular context. Yeah. And it turns out there is an entire um, subset, subdomain yeah, of software engineering based around this called uh, DDD, Domain Driven Design. And this is the original text on the left, whoops, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. But these days, you know, it, it's 20 years old. You know, it's not going to make a lot of sense to somebody brought up in today's software environment. So I would really recommend the uh, the, the one on the right instead. This is a, a really good summary of what's in the, uh, the book on the left. So domain driven design, DDD as it's called, it's all based around two main con um, concepts. And the first concept is that we want to build a ubiquitous language. You know, we want to come up with a terminology that we can understand that the customer can understand. And then once we have that terminology developed, we want to use it absolutely everywhere, including in all documentation, all tests and, uh, and in the code. And then the other idea is that we need to realize that no matter how good a job we do building this ubiquitous language, it's only valid in one box, you know, and that box could be one particular industry or one part of one industry or one part of one company within one industry and so on. So well, we have this ubiquitous language, but it only works within a bounded context. So we may need to define multiple languages for multiple contexts. And that's just the uh, that's just the way it is. Right. So number eight, uh, that the next two are more uh, more coding related. Uh, I used to say that functional programming is the future. You know, go out and learn more about FP because it's going to be really relevant to you in years to come. Yeah. But the future is now. <laughs> yeah. So we started out in procedural programming languages. Then we had object oriented programming languages. Then we had object oriented programming languages that ran inside a virtual machine. And now we've gone one stage further where we have object oriented languages that run inside a virtual machine, but also are hybrids of object and functional programming. So the functional programming style, uh, very important, of course, in academia since the 60s, you know, if not before. But for various reasons that we don't have time to get into, um, functional programming has become incredibly important over the past 10 years, you know, in the uh, in the software industry. So it used to be you could be a programmer in industry and be completely ignorant of the functional style. That is absolutely absolutely no longer the case. Okay, so functional programming is at least as important as OO programming is these days. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that OO has in any sense failed or is going away. Okay, so uh, all the, the core OO principles of abstraction and encapsulation and, and interfaces and uh, component based development and all this kind of thing, they're going to be with us forever because we need to, uh, to write code in teams. And in order to get anything done in a realistic um, amount of time, we need libraries and frameworks and so on, like .NET, like Enterprise Java, uh, like the, the Python libraries or AWS libraries or whatever it happens to be. So OO is still incredibly important and definitely not going anywhere. Yeah. So we all need to be able to speak the uh, the object oriented terminology. Yeah. But now functional programming is at least as important as OO is. Yeah. So we need to be aware of the uh, the functional uh, terminology as well. 
So there's a whole bunch of uh, books and articles and so on. And uh, I would love to spend the rest of the day just talking about you know, the, the ways in which functional programming has uh, has affected what we do in industry over the past decade. And, you know, but we, uh, we, we must move on, unfortunately. Um, just to say that you can use functional programming in different ways. If you don't end up using it within the language itself, okay, then you'll use it for communication between components because you may have heard of something called reactive programming. So assuming that we wish to deploy a, a large distributed system, well, these days we're probably going to deploy it as a, a set of microservices, let's call them. So we're going to, to deploy a, a cloud of microservices. And uh, those microservices will need to communicate with each other. So one way in which they can communicate with each other is through reactive streams. And a reactive stream at the end of the day is just a pipe. Uh, where at one end of the pipe you have a component with one or more provider threads and at the other end we have a different component with one or more uh, consumer threads yeah and then items are rolling down the pipe yeah so items get sent down the pipe from one component to the other but as they come down that pipe we can apply all the operators of functional programming so we can filter we can map we can flat map we can partition we can reduce you know we can do all of these things so uh, reactive programming, programming with reactive streams is an extension of functional programming. So if you don't end up doing FP at the level of the language, you'll end up doing it at the level of reactive streams, you know, because that is very much, you know, the uh, the, the current fashion yeah, in, uh, in systems architecture and distributed systems design and so on. And uh, it turns out that uh, OO and functional programming are not different things. You know, uh, each is the uh, the mirror image of the other. Yeah. So to give you a view of the history of this and why it should be the case, uh, absolutely amazing talk there by Kevlin Henney. If you're at all interested in FP or the differences between OO and FP, I cannot recommend that talk enough. Really, really good. Right. So number nine, uh, a little bit of reassurance. OK, uh, we live in a world of polyglot programming. OK, so if you think back to that diagram I showed you earlier, there were an awful lot of programming languages on it. OK, so you're going to go out into industry and uh, Java, incredibly popular language, of course, you know, one of the, the, the mainstream languages of industry used all over the place. But lots of people will also be doing Kotlin and Scala and Clojure. Yeah. C Sharp, of course, huge, major, incredibly popular language. But, you know, the, the real gurus are slowly moving off C sharp onto F sharp and so on. Uh, so we live in a world of polyglot programming. But the really good news is all the languages are converging. <laughs> OK, because uh, uh, as a, a colleague of mine used to say, you know, all the, the really important ideas about programming were invented in the 80s, apart from the ones that were invented between the 50s and the 70s. <laughs> OK, so uh, in the case of programming and the JVM, there was a research language called Pizza. And uh, Pizza went out and proved that generics and functional programming could be made to work on the uh, the JVM. So all the things that we've enjoyed from Java 8 onwards and all of the goodies that are in Kotlin and Scala and so on, uh, these can be traced back to Pizza, which was itself only implementing earlier ideas, you know, from the, the world of programming. So uh, we work in a world of polyglot programming. There are many, 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 many different languages being used in industry. If I was coming into industry, that would totally freak me out. <laughs> OK, but the good news is they're all converging. OK, so to, to give you an example, we prefer strong typing. OK, so we don't want to say let M and then M be a variable that could hold a string or a number or a Boolean or an employee object or a mutant object or whatever it happens to be. You know, uh, we want strong typing. Yeah, but we don't str want strong typing getting in the way. OK, so we can say, hey, this new keyword, is it actually useful? Ah, not really. No. <laughs> yeah. And then why do we have to use the word mutant twice? Yeah. Why can't the compiler, compiler infer the type of the variable from what it's being assigned to? Yeah. So what we want is we want type inference and so on. So all programming languages are following this path. You know, all programming languages are converging on the same set of ideas. So uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time left, but let me just try and prove it to you. So let's say we define a type called person, a class called person with a constructor that takes a string called name and saves it in a field. Uh, that's line one. OK, and then in line three, we
we define a function called display that takes a person and then we're going to print out the person's name. Yeah. And then uh, we need a main function. However, our, our language lets us define a main function. And inside there, as conveniently as possible, we want to define a list of strings and these are going to be names. And then, excuse me, using the techniques of functional programming, we will transform each string into a person object and then invoke the display method to print them out. OK, so that's what we're doing in the code there. That is the Scala 3 version of the code. OK, uh, here's the Kotlin version of the code. Yeah, and all I need you to notice is it's pretty much exactly the same thing. <laughs> you know, we can create a type in one line. We can create the display function in a single line. We can do string interpolation. It is that then moving into the main function, there's a very convenient way to create a, a list of strings. We don't need to say new array list or anything verbose like that. And then we have functional programming available. Yay, you know. So that's the Kotlin version. Here's the TypeScript version. And again, virtually the same thing over again. And in Java, you know, uh, Java for a long time suffered from, you know, falling behind, but Oracle has since taken the updating of Java very seriously, you know. So uh, by the time Java gets to 19, you know, uh, it'll be pretty much equivalent to where Kotlin is at the moment, you know, or I believe that's the, uh, the, the plan anyway, you know. But if you're using a modern version of Java, you have pretty much everything that we saw before anyway, yeah. So you can define a type in a single line of code and get the constructor written for you, you just have to define it as being a record, you know, rather than a class. So that, that's Java 14. Uh, we can do string interpolation using the formatted function and uh, multi-line strings, you know, have now come to uh, to Java as well. And then as of Java 11, we don't need to say a new array list or new link list or new whatever, you know, uh, we've got the factory functions on the interfaces for the collection. So we can say list of, set of, map of and so on. And then uh, we've got type inference as well. So we can just say var. And then as of Java 8, you've got the streams API. So um, we do have the inconvenience of having to say dot string, you know, and that gives us our conveyor belt of items. But thereafter, it's pretty much the same. <laughs> OK, so, uh, you know, a few twists and turns aside. Yeah, uh, everything that you have in the, the more modern programming languages, uh, you also have in Java at the minute, you know, and that's a, that, that's really good to see. Same thing for C sharp. You know, it's all in C sharp, but a, a few twists and turns because they had to uh, fit it into an existing language. Right, almost out of time, definitely don't want to overrun. So final thing, uh, the jungle is neutral, okay? This may seem a little bit obscure. Let me just explain what I mean. So uh, we run a developer event called DevBash, and uh, I really would encourage all of you to attend the, the DevBash events, free food, you know? And uh, we, we do great tech talks, and uh, in happier times, you know, we, we bring people over to, uh, to, to give talks about specialist areas of software development. But anyway, uh, we had a DevBash event, uh, on the theme of our software engineers professionals. And I, I did this talk, which is online. So people, as they say, take a different view on this, you know, but I believe very strongly that we're not a profession. Not yet. You know, we're, we're kind of what you get before you get a profession. Yeah. So if you think about doctors and lawyers and so on, you know, you could say exactly what kind of training they get, you know, exactly what kind of qualifications they need and then what professional certifications must follow on and what periods of mentorship they must go. And that's kind of, you know, that that's laid down. Yeah. And then uh, you could say where they would be at different stages of their career. So you could say, okay, assuming this person is qualified in this area after five, 10, 15 years, you know, assuming all's going well, uh, where should they have ended up? Um, and uh, you can describe that the kinds of mentoring that they'll get, as I say. And then also you can talk about the different specializations that they can go into. So if they were uh, a doctor, you could say they, they might become a surgeon. And then even if they become a surgeon, you can talk about the different specialities of surgery that they can go into. Or if they were a lawyer, there are different kinds of law, you know. So uh, you wouldn't go to somebody doing criminal law, yeah, and expect them to be able to do some other completely different kind of law, you know. So uh, that, that's what it means to be 
uh, in a professional um, um, profession. <laughs> yeah. So uh, are we there as an industry? Not quite yet. OK. And that means that you're going to have to promote yourself. OK. So one of the biggest problems that I had from my education, and I'm sure that you have from yours, is the idea that, you know, life is a meritocracy. Yeah. Where uh, all you need to do to get on is to write really good code, you know, and uh, check that code in and that uh, your contributions will be truly and you know rewarded for for everything that you've done and so on sadly not <laughs> you know uh, you're going to have to raise your profile um, you're going to have to do a bit of self promotion you know you're going to have to uh, stand up in the meeting and make the case for what you've done uh, and so on okay so um but because we're not a profession and because we don't have these well lined out career paths and so on, uh, you're going to have to take control. OK, so um, so I, I read a lot of military history and uh, there's this amazing book, incredibly famous book, The Jungle is Neutral. Yeah. Uh, about a team of soldiers who find themselves trapped behind enemy lines during World War Two. And um, it's partially about the guerrilla campaign that they ended up waging, but more about just how the, the way they managed to survive, <laughs> you know, and uh, the the author's main point is that the jungle is neutral. You know, the jungle will give you everything you need to uh, to survive and to flourish. But uh, if you stop taking care of your personal hygiene and let tiny scratches get infected or, you know, stop fe feeding yourself regularly or all these other things or, you know, let, let yourself get cold or wet or whatever, then you're dead. <laughs> you know, so uh, that that's kind of my metaphor for the uh, the industry. You know, definitely uh, the software industry is a great place to work. Uh, there's all kinds of rewards. There's all different kinds of directions you can go on to and so on, you know, but uh, we are very, very uh, far away from being uh, an ideal profession. We are very, very far away from having the uh, the standards that we need. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to make up, you know, and uh, because of that, you know, for us as an individual, well, you're going to have to engage in some self-promotion. You're going to have to uh, go out and manage your own career path. Uh, above all else, you're going to have to be brutally honest, you know, and say, where do I want to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years? You know, do I love programming above all else as that going to be my my life, you know, or uh, do, do I want to um, work as a programmer and show that I can do it and so on? But then, is there some other kind of work that I would much rather spread out into, you know? And uh, that is most people, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if that is you, yeah, we'll then start planning for it uh, immediately. Okay. Cool. So, oh yeah, my, my favorite tweet of all time. Programmers are people who agreed to do homework for the rest of their lives. OK, uh, very, very true. OK, and that doesn't just mean learning about new programming languages, libraries and frameworks. It also means learning about the customer, learning about the problem domain, learning about the company that you're in, doing the networking, you know, all that hard graft. And the worst graft of all is the graft that you don't want to do. But that's uh, that's the most important bit. Right, so here we are. Uh, these are the, uh, the the ten things that we've run through. Uh, so uh, I won't bother summing up because the talk is recorded, so you can always play it again. So uh, these are the ten things I would most wish that somebody had told me, you know, whenever I'd uh, I'd entered the industry. So hopefully, you having heard them, you know, they will be uh, of benefit and use to you. So uh, let me stop talking at that point and uh, open the floor up for questions. Garth, thanks very much for that inspiring talk. I hope there are a few questions. Anybody want to fire in a few ideas, anything that struck them, anything they want to ask our speaker this morning, this afternoon? Garth, can I maybe just say there are a lot of uh, points here, I'm sure, Everybody present will be familiar with have encountered these things, and it's great maybe to hear them coming from uh, somebody who's involved in professional training, that importance of getting used to version control, fast feedback cycles, great. And we've got Friday advisories with advisors there to listen to how things are going on to provide feedback on them. Lots of great ideas. I think maybe we can look at the things that were doing currently and, you know, decide, well, uh, might feel a bit uneasy about this. This is something that knocks me out of my routine, but this is something that I really need to, to look into. 
any hints maybe just of overcoming those those different thresholds? I'm embarrassed about asking for feedback about this. Oh, using the version controls a bit too fiddly. Just give somebody the memory pen, or you know, yeah, should I yeah. bother looking at new ways of writing Java uh, to maybe give a nod towards functional program. What would you say are the the what kind of recommendations would you make to people who maybe want to cross those different thresholds? Yeah, well, uh, the thing I would say is eat the envelope one. Sorry, eat the ele envelope. Eat the elephant <laughs> one uh, one little spoonful at a time. Okay, so just for example, let's say you wanted to try Kotlin or Scala or TypeScript. Yeah, well, there are online consoles, you know, for for all of these things. So you don't have to install anything on your own machine or anything like that. Uh, you can just go and use the uh, the online consoles. Yeah, or uh, let let's say you want to get started with Git, but it's the weekend and you're not going to be doing this that or the other thing just have a youtube playlist okay so you can know that's what i do i mean whenever i'm getting into an area that i know nothing about and i really don't want to um i i go to youtube and i find videos uh done by people i respect or people who are recommended by people i respect and i put together a playlist and then i have that playlist playing in the guitar or the guitar in the car or uh whenever i'm working out in the gym or something like that and um, i'm not trying to attend to every single little detail I'm just keeping it in the background and soaking it up you know and I'm listening to what are the high points that everybody keeps making and what what are the themes that keep coming up and what are the jokes that everybody's laughing at you know and so on so yeah I, I would say just try and eat the elephant one spoonful at a time and it comes back to that point about feedback cycles and so on so um you know that there's no way that let's say you need to learn a new framework or something that you're going to go out and master it all in one go find out how to write hello world you know find a, a hello world tutorial and make that your objective for the week you know and that's a that's achievable and that's not going to be scary or uh, if you need to do a talk yeah and uh, you want to be a conference speaker well well don't go out and start applying to all these major international conferences where you know you you need um, a really large accumulated body of work before they would even consider you uh, there are any number of small little user groups Groups around the place uh, you know Belfast is incredibly blessed with there's a meetup for just about every programming language or style of development you've ever heard of yeah and uh, as long as you have something interesting to say uh, they'll be incredibly welcoming and uh, you know if you want to write articles well uh, again you can just go out and start a blog and medium yeah or you can contribute something to uh, a university publication or a local thing or whatever it happens to be you know so uh, that first step don't make it a leap <laughs> you know so so find a, a nice simple first step and uh, build up your confidence from there brilliant many thanks Garth, for that look we're probably pushing now towards lunchtime if People don't have questions now. If they want to channel them through me, I'll pass them on to, to God. Yes, my, my email is available, and please feel free to use it. Absolutely, yeah. That's right, and it's it's uh, great to, to have that expertise shared with you this morning. Great to hear some of those images as well, the, the car and the hammer and the <laughs> elephant spoonful by spoonful, but it's all great stuff, and it's always <laughs> worth remembering. Okay, everyone, if you want to... Uh, just express your thanks in the, the normal way. We'll wrap up today's talk. I'll see you in person on site again on Wednesday morning. Can we thank Garth again for that tremendous talk? An awful lot of great ideas covered this morning, and you might want to look back at the recording again to take some of those ideas in and, uh, and reflect on them. So thank you so much, Garth, this morning. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Morning, and uh, see you all again on Wednesday.